Good evening, everyone. It's Dr. McCoy. It's about 6.59, and we usually start at 7 p.m. on Thursdays, Eastern Standard Time. But I started at 6.59 just to give people some time to come in if you're joining live, and also to give people time on our conference call line, okay? So good evening to you. It's actually 7 o'clock now, so I gave us a little time. But I'm certainly glad that you're here on this evening. I want us to focus on the fact that uh, in October, we really highlight domestic violence or Domestic Violence Awareness Month is, is October. But we know that every uh, month, every day, you know, we can really focus on um, domestic abuse and violence and really our awareness being raised. And so today is called Purple Thursday. I have on my shirt, it just simply says, we wear purple for domestic violence awareness. And so many of you may already know that, uh, you know, we wear purple and the purple ribbon signifies um, domestic violence awareness. And so I wore my purple today. Um, if you didn't get to wear yours today, that's okay. Um, you can wear purple anytime. It's just that uh, this particular day is Purple Thursday. And so since we gather on Thursday, I thought it to be important that I focus on domestic violence, domestic abuse and violence. I can tell you that I have the great honor of teaching um, at Shaw University Divinity School. One of these courses, one of the courses that I teach is domestic abuse and violence and the church, the church and domestic abuse and violence. And so this topic is very close to my heart. Um, I try my best to help my students to be and to become trauma-informed faith leaders. There are a lot of faith leaders out there, but not all faith leaders are trauma-informed. And so for those who have the opportunity um, to take that particular course, um, you know, get to talk about some real things, um, different types of abuse. And so I won't go into this as if I am the professor, you know, there is no way really to get that kind of information into 30 minutes. But just out of respect for those who are survivors, those who are overcomers, some say those who are victims, um, and for those of us who care and we are advocates, I want to do my best to just give us some information. Some of this stuff, you know, you already know. But then there are some things uh, that need to be revisited. And so the first thing I want to do is be sure that everybody has the National Domestic Violence Hotline. That number is 1-800-799-7233. Again, the domestic, uh, National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-7233. And um, it's important to have that number on hand um, not just for not just for those who, um, you know, find themselves as victims, if you want to use that word, but also for those who, um, you know, want to be of help. So make sure you keep that number 1-800-799-7233. That number can be called from anywhere. So then the first thing I want to do is remind us, if we don't know already, of different types of abuse. Now I'm going to show you a couple of the books that I have my students to read at, uh, at the university just in case you want to have these. Um, you don't have to be in school or necessarily take a class, but you do need to be informed. And so there are resources, okay? And I'm going to talk about a couple of things in these books. And for those of you on the conference call line, thank you so much for joining. I'm going to be sure that I give you information because you can't see me. Um, so the first book that I'm showing is entitled, Is It Abuse? And it is a biblical guide to identifying domestic abuse and helping victims. It's by Darby Strickland, and it's a really good book that I use um, when teaching uh, my course. But again, it, it is a great practical book um, to where she uses words that we can understand and we don't have to go to a dictionary to look them up, um, you know, practical information. So what I want to do is share information from that book. And then I want you to stay tuned in because another book that I have my students to read is in is in is uh, called abuse of men by women abuse of men by women and this book is written by ann silvers 
And so the, the front cover for those on the conference call line, the, the book just is Abuse of Men by Women. It happens, it hurts, and it's time uh, to get real, real about it. So I'm going to talk about domestic abuse and violence from various vantage points and perspectives, okay? Because it's important that we be informed. Everybody's story is not the same. And some things may shock you, but there are other things um, that, uh, you know, that you may already know. So some of this is going to be a refresher, okay? So types of abuse, types of abuse. What types of abuse um, have you heard of? Um, I won't ask what types of abuse have you dealt with. I mean, if you want to share that in this space, that's fine, but you don't have to do that, okay? Um, just what are some types of abuse? Well, you may say, um, Dr. McCoy, I'm familiar with uh, verbal abuse, mental abuse. Okay, well, that will also fall under emotional abuse. So when thinking about that type of abuse, emotional abuse, it can be mental, it can be verbal. It's when someone, uh, the oppressor, is uh, really promoting this sense of fear onto uh, the, the victim, okay? Um, they are also uh, promoting guilt, shame towards that person. And it's really about control. That's what abuse is about. Um, emotional abuse is a form of neglect. It's a form of isolating, belittling someone, um, blaming them. Uh, I said shaming. It's about uh, threatening them even. That can happen as well. Playing mind games and lying. That is a form of abuse called emotional abuse. So maybe you've heard of that type of abuse. Um, another type is financial abuse. Financial abuse. Um, financial abuse is really a way of controlling a person, really making them economically dependent upon you. So if you are that type of oppressor and you want to control, then that means that, you know, it can be subtle, it can be overt, but it could be something like concealing financial information. If you are being abused financially, it could be that the person is holding uh, or keeping uh, secret accounts. Um, we find financial abuse, um, as I said, I'm going to talk about when, uh, when women abuse men. Um, think about how women may try to use finance against a man. You know, uh, maybe they're separated or divorced or something. They have children together, so she uses, tries to use his finances, you see, against him. So there are men who suffer financial abuse at the hand of, of women. You know, just controlling maybe their ability to, um, to get money or exploiting their resources, that's financial abuse. Dictating how funds are spent is another way that people can uh, financially abuse a person. And so um, if someone uses someone's identity, you know, without their permission, um, you know, some people might even argue that when um, parents put their bills or something in their children's names, you know, some people may say, well, that's a form of financial abuse because that child could not give consent and that parent used that child's um, social security number. So then when that child gets older, they're not able to obtain some of the things that they need in order to have a, a, a good life. You, you see how abuse spans across generations, ages, um, gender, you know, um, and so it's important for us to focus on it. And I try to do the full scope, okay? So abuse can happen. Domestic violence and abuse can happen to anybody. It's not just women and it's not just children. Um, it's not just older people. It's not just young people. You know, it could be anybody. It's when someone really wants to oppress another person. So maybe you have thought about or you're thinking about physical abuse. You know, that may be one of the most common forms of uh, domestic violence that people focus on. Maybe they don't focus on financial so much. Maybe they don't focus on emotional so much because they feel like you can't see that. You know, um, the hand is raised, there's a bruise on my face, and so you know you can see physical abuse, you see. And so that's why a lot of times people focus on that. Well, you know, that's important to focus on. It. It's about kicking, biting, uh, scratching, pulling hair, throwing objects, destroying property. That's a form of physical abuse as well. So not just to your person, but even to your property. Withholding needed medication. 
Some of our, that's why I talked about it not just being about age, you know, just about a young person or, you know, like a child. It could even happen to our elderly community. Withholding medication, that is a form of physical abuse. So this is why it's so very important, you know, on this Purple Thursday that we consider some of the things that people may be facing. Uh, what about, um, okay, so I mentioned emotional, mental, verbal abuse. I mentioned financial abuse. I mentioned physical abuse. But what about spiritual abuse? What about spiritual abuse? Now, many times, you know, I know in churches that I have been in, I can't speak for every church, but I know growing up in church as a young person, many times I would hear people say, oh, people talk about church hurt, you know, but you were hurt on your job and you still go to work. You know, you're hurt in your family or whatever, and you still part of your family, you know, and so many times spiritual abuse is not something that is addressed even in faith communities. But please know, as we're thinking about domestic abuse and violence and how we are thinking of it, especially in October and on today, Purple Thursday, please know that spiritual abuse is a real thing. You know, um, everybody's story is not simply that somebody stepped on their toe and that was church hurt, so they never went back to church. No, some people are actually spiritually abused. It's when the oppressor, could they, they establish this type of control and, and, and domination by using scripture, by using doctrine and other, their leadership role, if you will, as weapons. That absolutely happens. So sometimes when people say they've had church hurt, they may not be able to express to you that what they're really talking about is spiritual abuse and it is a real thing. So then what happens is many times within our churches, we dismiss it and say, oh, you've been hurt in other places. Just get over it and come on back to the church. You see that? But spiritual abuse, it may mask itself as religious practice and may be used to shame or punish people. And if somebody has dealt with that, when religion hurts, if somebody has dealt with that, to simply push it aside, and this is why I'm so grateful I get to teach this at the seminary, because many of my, my students are either uh, pastors in the local church or they aspire to be pastors in the local church. So it's important before they become pastors or as they are pastoring that they consider, again, becoming a trauma-informed faith leader. That's very important because there are people who suffer various types of abuse, but sometimes we focus on the physical and we just let the other slide because in our mind, oh, church hurt, for example, oh, that's, that's trivial. You just get over it and you come back. But if it's spiritual abuse, that means that this person, you know, growing up perhaps or, or in a faith community, and it's not just in churches, they can use scripture, they can use the Quran, they can use other, you know, religious tactics. But the Bible, for example, was used again, maybe for shame or control, uh, demanding uh, unconditional uh, obedience, where the person, the leader, if you will, is demanding more obedience to him or her than to God. Hmm. That's spiritual abuse. Using those things to rationalize even abusive behavior. So, spiritual abuse. Okay, so I've talked about emotional abuse, which is both verbal and mental. I've talked about uh, financial abuse. i talked about physical abuse. I've talked about uh, spiritual abuse. And what about sexual abuse? Hmm. Now, again, I don't have enough time to go through everything, but I'm trying to just give us an overview before I start talking about how to support survivors. So I'm wearing the shirt today as a supporter, but I need to know what does that mean? So I'm going to get into that. Okay. But the last one I want to talk about is sexual abuse. And I think that, um, I think that many of us, you know, we understand that. I think many of us even know about like uh, sex trafficking that happens, right? Well, sexual sexual abuse is about um, heinous, uh, exploitive acts that involve sex. Sex being involved, it's demanded, it's required. Um, you know, it's taken by force, like in instances of rape um, and other force acts. I see you, oh, sister... 
Sister Samantha, this is good. Oh, God bless you. I'm glad it's helping. Brother Coleman is asking, what if a man gets abused physically by a woman and embarrassed to report it because they think nothing will happen? There you go. That's a great question. Well, what I can say is this is why, you know, we have, for example, I keep bringing up Shaw University Divinity School because that's where I'm a professor and we have this course. Um, so that's one thing is that people need to be educated on the fact that certain types of abuse are considered taboo. We don't talk about it enough. We don't put it out there enough, Brother Coleman. And so there are men who are like, well, nobody's talking about this, so I'm just not going to say anything. Or I'm embarrassed, so I'm not going to say anything. Um, so that's why we have October as Domestic Abuse and Violence Awareness Month. You need to bring people into your space, wherever you work, um, whoever you work with, have somebody come and talk, you know, about this. Thank God that I've been invited to a church, for example, to talk about this over in Winston-Salem. We just have to have more conversations, Brother Coleman, because some people don't even talk about how prevalent women, you know, the abuse of men by women really is. And so what I'm going to do, Brother Coleman, and to answer your question further is I'm going to talk to us tonight about how we can support you know, bringing out that conversation, what types of questions to ask, what to look for, okay? Because that's a great question, so I'm, I'm going to definitely get to that. Um, but uh, but yeah, if, if sexual abuse is involved, that means that someone may demand that a person, you know, many times we think just women. If you notice, I'm not saying just women, because men, boys can be sexually abused, demanding that they wear uh, more or less provocative clothing. That's not about gender. That's about an oppressor wanting to control the victim, right? Making demands for sex, um, threatening to expose intimate details or photos. If you don't do, if you don't uh, have this sexual act happening, then I'm going to post pictures of you that I have on social media. Look at that. So those are just um, types of abuse, okay, that I wanted to share. And so um, I'm going to talk some more, uh, Brother Coleman, since you asked that question. Let me talk a little more. I showed this book here, um, and you can order this on Amazon. Um, but it's called Abuse of Win uh, Abuse of Men by Women. See how I almost said women? Because many times, Brother Coleman, we don't talk about how women abuse men. So let me talk a little bit about this since you asked that great question. Um, since you asked that great question. Okay, so let's think about this. How can a woman abuse a man? Because again, many times people think about abuse as just being something physical. So it's like... You know, me, for example, if you've ever seen me in real life or I guess ever seen a picture of me or whatever, I'm kind of a small person. Like, I'm not like really tall. You know, I you could almost blow and probably blow me away. Like, I'm just not a a big person. And I don't mean like as far as um, just like, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just not a big person. I'm kind of a small person. So like if if uh, Brother Coleman, I've seen you before. I know who you are. You know who I am. So if someone were to see Brother Coleman, he's like like six feet, you know, six foot tall, maybe six two. And here I am like five, two and a half, you know, and look at my little hand. Everybody on the conference call line, I'm just holding up my little hand where Brother Coleman's hand is much bigger than mine. So like really people think about physical abuse and they would think, oh, Dr. McCoy could never abuse, you know, Brother Coleman. But the fact is, Women, abuse of men by women goes against cultural expectations, you know, for both genders. And so we don't talk about it. But how could I abuse a man through lying, through manipulation, misuse of funds, uh, badgering a man? Um, physical attack, because women do that. Um, I could go and I could destroy his property, key his car, you know, um, and, and there's just so many things that I could do. But since women are thought of or considered in our society mostly as nurturing and men are expected to be strong and in control, we don't always talk about it. So we need to talk about it more. And then we need to know, again, how to talk to men or how to listen to men and ask probing questions. Um, but, but these things can happen in dating. Uh, it can happen in marriage, divorce, post-divorce, um, post-breakup, dating, romantic relationships. It absolutely happens. So it's not that I'm saying that, um, I'm not saying that women are abusive. I'm saying that there are abusive women. 
okay? Um, and sometimes they do it and we need to talk about it. I see you all saying, um, oh, Brother F Freeman, talk about it because folk think men can't be abused by women. There you go. It happens all the time. And I see you, Sister Brenda. Can you fix the camera, please? I only see half of you. Oh, you only see half of me? Okay, let me see if I can, uh, if I can adjust it. Okay. All right. Is that better? Or maybe I need to sit up straight. All right. Maybe I need to sit up straight because I don't think that what I see is what you see. And I kind of see half as well. So I don't, I'm not sure, but I hope that helped Sister Brenda. Um, so yes. Yeah, so, so let me keep talking. So let's talk about um, or let me talk about, I'm saying let's talk about, because you all do a great, um, a great job of talking back to me. I see you, Brother Freeman, saying it may be her camera. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So now I've talked about types of abuse and how, you know, sometimes we don't talk about various types. And I'm going to be sure to give that national domestic um, violence hotline again. I see you, Sister Brenda. Okay, so yes, it's good. Okay, all right. So supporting survivors, supporting survivors. And if you are a survivor, I, I applaud you. Um, I hope that you have been able to um, help other people. You get to choose whether or not you tell your story and you get to choose how you help. Um, so I hope that you've been able to perhaps help someone else. Um, you could have been abused as a child, um, as a spouse or a girlfriend. You could have been abused in church or in your faith community. You could have been abused on a job. Um, and so I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. And if you're going through it now, I am so sorry. Um, I hope that you will seek the help uh, that's available to you. There is help. And so what can those of us on the side of supporting, what can we do? Well, um, the first thing we have to do is believe the survivor. Okay. Believe the survivor um, and know that it, each person's story is different and each person's story is their own. So listen to them and believe them. That's the first thing is, okay, I believe you. Um, remember when I was saying uh, to Brother Coleman there, if a man reported that, my first thought shouldn't be, oh, you're a man. What are you talking about? That little woman? No, no, no. So again, if you're going to support a survivor, the first thing you need to do is listen and believe them. Listen and believe them. The second thing is to understand that it's not the person's fault. They are a victim at the hand of an oppressor. And the victim is never at fault, okay? So when a person commits an act of violence, they do that by choice, okay? If I am a violent person, I'm doing that by choice. Now let's go to the Bible. The apostle Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. And he admits in the Bible when talking, when writing to Timothy, that he was an abusive person. I'm going to preach about it on Sunday. <laughs> it's in there. I read it. It's in there. I'm preaching about it. He says that he was a violent man. He chose to have Christians persecuted. Domestic activity, domestic violent activity was part of Saul's life. So we don't say, oh, poor Saul. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't say, well, maybe he saw that when he was growing up. And so he's doing that because his dad did it to him. That may be a fact and he has a choice. So when Saul decided that he didn't want to do that anymore, he changed his behavior. So if you are an oppressor, if you are an abuser, I want to encourage you on this evening to know that you're in good company. Because Saul was an abuser. And then he allowed God to touch him and change him. He became Paul and he was no longer an abuser. No more violence. Okay? So you have to know that it is a choice in which the person uses, you know, chooses to use violence. Um, a lot of us, we may feel like we're going to snap. But we don't always become violent, right? We make a choice. I see you, Brother Freeman. Can you tap a little on the low self-esteem caused by the abusive mental oppressor? Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. So sometimes when people are abused, you know, you, you may be walking around right now with a low self-worth and you're thinking it's because you're fat. I'm just giving an example. It's because you're fat. That's why you have a low self-worth. Well, 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 
If, like Brother Freeman is talking about low self-esteem caused by abusive mental oppressor, if you have been oppressed throughout your life or in a relationship or something like that, even if you lose weight, because see, you're saying you're fat. That's why you have a low you know, uh, self-esteem. But even if you lose weight, because it is a mental oppression that has happened to you, like Brother Freeman is naming it, because it's mental, it's not going to be about your size. You can lose weight. You can even get a six-pack. But it's what the oppressor did to your mind that until you liberate your mind and you have the power to do that, okay? Until you liberate your mind, you're still not going to be free even after you lose 520 pounds. See that? So when an abuse, uh, a person abuses us mentally, we have to do a lot of work. Because we have been traumatized, and I want to talk about trauma. I don't think I'm going to have enough time. Um, but, but when a person is traumatized, we carry trauma in our bodies. And if we don't work with that thing, we carry that trauma and it ends up passing throughout generations. This is why, I'm going to go to the black community, for example. This is why, if you think about it, many of us were traumatized when it came to like our hair. Like you were taught, there you go, Sister Barbara, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you for bringing that up. I can talk about that as well. But but in the black community, um, I see it everywhere. We were traumatized, you know, when it came to like the kinks in our hair. Like you shouldn't have kinks in your hair. Your hair should be long flowing, you see? But, so mentally... It has been embedded into some, I'm not going to say every black person, I'm going to speak for every black person, I'm not going to do that, but I see it, you know, on social media, you know, in the media, you know, like famous people, we have to make our hair a certain way in order for it to be accepted. If we don't do that, then mentally there's something wrong. So we say that God made everything, God made everything that was good. But when we talk about hair, you hear in the black community, people talking about good hair. Now, we say when God made everything, it was good. That shouldn't exclude hair, right? But you'll hear a black person describing another black person. They'll say something like, you know, the guy with the good hair. You see that? So mentally, we have been oppressed even when it comes to our physical appearance. If we don't do certain things to our black bodies, then that means that they're not accepted. So that's an example of how the oppressor, you know, victimized even black people, black bodies, I should say. So then when you start to liberate your mind and you start changing that up, people are looking at you like, wait a minute, that's not what that's not what we do. Well, who is we? The fact is, you should be able to wear your hair the way that you choose to wear it, because everybody has good hair. So if you want to straighten your hair, more power to you. If you want the kinks in it, more power to you. If you don't have any hair, that's all right too. <laughs> I'm just making a point like uh, Brother Freeman is helping to uh, helping us to see. I'm making a point that low self-esteem can be connected to abusive mental behavior by oppressors. And I'm using that just as an example because I am of that, you know, I am black in America. So that is an example of a type of, of mental abuse that has been placed on people. And it's not just black people or just women or just men. I'm sure if you were to take time to think about your life and your existence and how people have treated you, you could point the, these things out that I'm talking about. And so, but, but for some people, for some people, there needs to be conversations, supportive conversations to help pull it out of them. Where is that coming from? Perhaps you've been abused, you've been oppressed. And again, we many times we think, not me, domestic abuse and violence haven't happened to me because nobody's ever hit me. But I'm going a little deeper, I hope, to help you think about this thing. And I see you, Brother Freeman, saying exactly true. It takes work to relinquish that trauma of mental abuse. There you go. And remember, mental abuse and verbal abuse falls under emotional abuse. All right? So I'm talking about victims and people out there, but I may be talking to the person inside of you. That's why this month and domestic abuse and violence is really important to talk about all the time. And there are so many layers that I wish I could get into with you. Um, but 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 I'm trying to give us some information now, ways to have a conversation, ways to have a conversation. OK, because this might be challenging. OK, um, 
Uh, so I'm not going to blame the victim. Um, I'm going to hold the offender accountable, just like a Saul Paul situation, like I said. Um, I'm going to understand that uh, abuse is rooted in control. That's really what it is. I want you to do what I want you to do. And I'm going to, you know, enact these various types of abuse, whichever one will work, because I want you to do what I want you to do. Um, uh, I'm going to, if I'm going to have a, a conversation, I'm going to trust the uh, survivor's perception. And I love calling them survivors. You know, I know in the books we call them victims many times, but survivors. Um, and I'm going to communicate that domestic violence is not a... Uh, private family matter how many children are being abused right now and they're not saying anything because what happens in this house stays in this house mm. so just having a conversation is important so so we have to practice those things you know that's really important so as an advocate what you can do is help uh, survivors and or victims really navigate systems and a plan for safety. I don't have time to talk about plan for safety, but plan for safety, many times survivors and or victims don't realize that each and every day they're making plans in their minds for safety, especially if they have children. They're thinking to themselves, okay, if this happens, where can I put my kids? Or if they, they don't realize that they're already doing it. But what you can do as an advocate is to help them with the conversation, you know, and ask questions like, well, before you ask a question, you need to say, I'm going to ask certain questions, not because I want to pry, but I really want to know your story and to see you know, um, what types of things, you know, are going on and, 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 and where, you know, if you need help and guidance, I might be able to serve you because there are community resources around, you know, there's mental health services, counseling, support groups. Now that means you need to know where they are. What state are you in? What city are you in? What town are you in? You need to know where they are. You're having that conversation. There are uh, support, you know, there's referrals, there's, you know, and then as you're saying those things, they may start thinking, oh, maybe I could use that. Maybe, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe that is something that I could, I could utilize. Maybe that's somewhere I could possibly go, but you have to have a, a safe conversation and you have to recognize signs so a conversation can happen, but you have to recognize signs. I see you, Brother Freeman. Pharaoh, the oppressor of the children of Israel, so much so, he oppressed them so much so that when they left Egypt, they couldn't understand and follow the law of God because they were programmed to follow the Egyptians' religious gods. Look at that. So like, uh, like Brother Freeman is doing, do you know the Bible? <laughs> you know, because you may be talking to someone who is a person of faith. And so that doesn't mean you're going to use the Bible to, you know, you know, not like that. But like Brother Freeman is doing, you know, if it comes up and they start talking about God, you know, um, you can. That's why I gave you I told you about this book. You can you can use a book like this, because what I like about the Strickland uh, text is that she incorporates scripture in this book as well. You know, a biblical guide to identifying domestic abuse and helping victims. So I'm not trying to tell you that you have to read all these books and you have to, you know, I appreciate doing it because it expands my mind on domestic abuse and violence and it prepares my pastors and my uh, those who aspire to be pastors and my uh, community workers, you know, at the at the seminary, you know, to be able to deal with these difficult, you know, topics. Some of them, you know, haven't even preached in their churches, for example, a sermon, you know, or even a Bible study that addresses domestic abuse and violence. Some of them have never done that. And they've been pastors, for example, for a number of years. Now I understand that some of them simply may be just a little hesitant because they just don't know how to do it. And that's why it's good that Shaw University Divinity School offers the course that they offer. It's very important. Um, we have in the Bible who? Tamar, who was raped. And we've never preached on Tamar. We've never taught on Tamar. I mean, even in October, Domestic Abuse and Violence uh, you know, Awareness Month. So if you are a faith leader 
you know, and I'm talking especially to pastors and you have not done that. I encourage you because there are people sitting in your pew and there's pain in the pew, certain types of pain. And I'm not talking about just preaching to them about, you know, you got sugar diabetes and God will heal you. I'm not talking about that type of pain. I'm not talking about he'll heal cancer. I'm not talking about that type of pain. You know, you got a wayward child, they can come home. I'm not talking about that type of pain. Those are great things to talk about. And there are people in the pew who have been sexually abused, financially abused, emotionally abused, or verbal and mentally. Uh, they have come from a church where they have been spiritually abused. They have been uh, abused sexually. And nobody in the church has ever spoken to that kind of pain. This is your opportunity. Get these books. You know, if you don't want to say it from you, say you've been reading, you know, and my goodness, talk about abuse of men by women. If you're a woman preacher, you know, if the men can't talk about it, you can talk about it. If you feel funny, you know, let your female uh, associate or somebody talk about it. It's just very, very important because there are signs, for example, that sometimes we don't even consider. And statistics show that we will come in contact with an individual experience of, experiencing domestic abuse and violence. We will. Not, not if we will. We absolutely will. But not all survivors are going to share their experience. But if we preach it and we teach it, then what, who knows what could possibly happen? Do we have ministries in our churches, you know, that address this? Do we do that? I told you, I was able to go to a church, wonderful church, you know, that is very, very open. You know, the pastor is very open about this information, but we have to listen for signs of violence during those conversations. Say things like, um, you know, even if it's over the phone, for example, and these are the types of things we can teach in that ministry at the church. Um, if it's over the phone, you say something like, it is now a safe time to talk? You know, don't just intrude into people's lives. Now, is now a safe time to talk? Um, are things safe at home for your children right now? You know, um, do you have access to services and resources you need? Um, is it safe for me to provide you with a phone number to call? That's when you give them the National Domestic Violence uh, Hotline, 1-800-799-7233. Um, you can say things like, uh, if you need me to hang up, you know, press, press the button. If you're safe, press the button. I mean, there are just different tactics. It's just important uh, that we train ourselves. I see you, Brother Freeman. They don't want to preach on those issues because the church isn't equipped to handle emotional abuse because church at some point is an abuser. Oh, now that's a conversation that some are not willing to have. Like I said, many times when we talk about church hurt, we don't consider it as spiritual abuse. But there is some. there are some things happening. I can tell you, let me just tell you, let me say this. There are people who have been abused by, for example, the deacon at the church. That's why they don't come to church. Ever thought about that? There are people who were um, neglected, child abuse and neglect, and it was by a religious parent. You ever thought about that? Um, we just have to be sure that just because it didn't happen to us, <laughs> thank God you grew up in a wonderful church. <laughs> thank God that it's been great for you. Thank God you have a great marriage. Thank God that as a child, you had a wonderful childhood. Congratulations on that. Thank God that, you know, nobody's ever tried to control you with money and you've never tried to control anybody with money. Thank God. Just remember that that's not everybody's story. It's not everybody's, it's not everybody's story. I see you, Brother Coleman. I think kids don't have a voice because I think kids don't have a voice because if they are being abused by an adult in the schoolhouse, who will believe them? How will the right action take place? That's that's good. Well, we have to create safe spaces, Brother Coleman. Um, the right action can take place when people feel comfortable. I mean, some of the things I'm talking about right now, you know, there are folks who won't talk about this. 
You know, they'll say, uh-uh, I'm not going to touch that. How dare you say that about the church? How dare you bring up spiritual abuse? How dare you bring up the fact that women abuse men? How dare you talk about that? Brother Coleman, somebody has to create a safe space. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just that person. <laughs> I'm that person. Um, because people are hurting and sometimes they will talk to me when they don't talk to other folks. And really, they need to be able to talk to some of these other folks. So I'm trying to help the other folks be comfortable enough so that your people can come to you, so that folks can talk to you, so that people would feel comfortable in your space. So we have to create safe spaces, uh, Brother Coleman. That's, that's a good point. And I see you, Brother Freeman. Yes, we need to get to the root of the problem. There you go. But we can't get to the root if we don't even acknowledge the tree, right? <laughs> I'm going to close with that because that's, that's kind of good. <laughs> we can't get to the root. Thank you, Brother Freeman. We can't get to the root of the problem. Like you, you can't see the roots of a tree. You see the tree first, right? So we can't get to the root of the problem if we don't recognize what's right in front of us. You see the tree before you see the root. Oh, you're saying no, no, no. You're saying don't stop. <laughs> Brother Freeman, the Bible teaches where there is counsel, there is safety. Oh, yes, I hear you. See there? So we just have to make comfortable spaces. And you're saying, no, don't stop. Okay, I'll, I'll go a little farther, okay? Because I do, I just have so much information. Um, okay, I'll talk a little bit. Let me talk some about, um, about the safety plan, okay? Let me talk about this. Um, so if you're helping someone to create a safety plan and you're having that conversation, and I'm talking about conversation. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it some more. Thank you for telling me not to stop. I'm going to keep going. I'm talking about the conversation because sometimes we don't know really how to talk to each other. Not because of any real, you know, issue. We just don't know what to say. And so sometimes we'll say, and this is not bad, but we'll say this, I'll pray for you. See that? It's easier to say that, right? <laughs> because you're going to do that. And prayer is absolutely important, okay? So I'm not dismissing prayer. I'm just saying, before you walk away and pray for me, I would love for you to listen to me. But you're uncomfortable with the conversation because I'm about to tell you that I'm being, you know, physically abused by my spouse. And you don't know how you're going to feel about him when you see him in church on Sunday morning or when he drops me off for work or when I get home and you're my neighbor. and He's out there mowing the grass. You're going to be like, oh, my God, she's physically abusing her. So you're going to tell me as a good Christian that you're going to pray for me. But what does it look like for you to sit with me in my pain? What does that look like? What does it look like when the Bible says those who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak? What does it look like for you to bear my infirmity? Pray for me, but do you even know what to pray for? You don't because you're walking away. So before you walk away, before you just go, I mean, before you do that, can you can you just ask me a question? Can, can you tell me a little, a little bit about uh, what you've been noticing? What happened after that? Um, you know, uh, because I might be traumatized. So you're going to help me work through my trauma. Um, you might say, uh, what has protected you and your children in the past? Now you're going to help me with a safety plan. What makes you feel safe? What is a place that makes you feel safe? You know, um, you you say you don't you, you don't feel comfortable. What what tell me more about that? You say you do feel comfortable about this. Tell me about that. Uh what what is it like for you? What was that moment like for you? What if I need to talk about it? What if I do? <laughs> Then what? Well, maybe I just need to get a, a, a therapist. Okay, but you're here right now and you're my brother. You're my sister. See that? And like Brother Freeman is saying, it's trust. It's the trust issue at times why we refuse to expose the situation. And, you know, like I said, it's uncomfortable for me to sit and listen to the situation. See that? But what if, Brother Freeman, because you bring up a good point about trust. What if, Brother Freeman... We talked about this as freely as we did uh, people getting COVID vaccines. There was a lot of talk about that. Everybody was concerned about everybody's physical well-being. Weren't you concerned about that then? Okay, well, domestic abuse and violence is about my physical well-being. What if we talked about that as much as we do all the other things? And I'm not just talking about in the church. I'm talking about people among people. You know, we talk about so many things to the point where we make it comfortable, right? 
What if this became a comfortable topic? Not comfortable because it feels good. It's never going to be comfortable in that regard. But it can be comfortable because we're simply having a conversation. You see that? Um, we start talking about what to say and what not to say. Because nobody's saying anything. It's like, shh. And, and I think there's a slogan that says uh, something like, I saw a billboard about domestic violence. It says something like, stop the violence, stop the silence, or something like that. And the lady had like her, her mouth covered. So part of the problem is the silence. So then what does it look like to talk? Well, it's helpful to say um, it, it's understandable. Not I understand. Stop, you know, we need to stop saying that. <laughs> I understand, uh, but I'm the one in the situation, not you. So just it's understandable. Or I could even say, you know, I can't even imagine something like that. You know, maybe I don't understand it. But you can say it's understandable, not I understand. Or I've heard survivors say, or I've heard victims of domestic abuse and violence say, no, 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 no. Say, um, I hear how you feel. See that? So I'm not comparing them to another person that's being through it. So I heard survivors say, no, I hear how you feel. You know, or based off of what you just said, I know how you feel because you just told me. See something like that. Um, or you, uh, it, it's helpful to say, um, or, you know, it's, don't say, I know how you feel. Don't say, I felt your pain. No, no, no. Don't say that. <laughs> Even if you have. Maybe you've been through it as well. Oh, I've been there, done that. Don't say that. I've been there, done it. That's why we're losing a lot of youth because adults are comparing themselves to kids in 2023. You can't compare yourself to a kid in 2023 because you're not a kid in 2023. That's one of the problems with us you losing our youth. We're saying, I felt your pain. I've been there. And then what do we say? I'm going down the road that you're going. You know, I've been down the road. That's what I hear people say that all the time. They're going down the road that you already traveled. <laughs> Why not say, you might want to think about. See that? You might want to think about. So you might know what you know, and that's fine. But just make sure you frame it right. Don't say, I already know. But you might want to think about, or have you thought about, you know, um, you might say something like, you know, don't say it will be better soon. I know that's what we say. Uh, even when it comes to our faith, you know, we say something like, uh, it's going to get better. It's going to be, what if it doesn't get better? Is God still God then? You told me a year ago it was going to get better <laughs> and it's still the same. Actually, it's worse. <laughs> you probably should not have told me it would get better. You probably should have said something like, well, you have the option to da 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 whatever, and God is still God or something like that. But don't tell me it's going to get better soon. Don't, don't, don't tell me that. Um, or it will be over soon. No, say something like you get to choose. See that? You get to choose. That's liberating. Hear that? Yeah. Um, you might say, uh, if your best friend were here, what would you tell them? If your best friend were here, what would you tell them? Or not, uh, this will give you closure. Or let me tell you, no, you're not there to tell them what to do. You're not there. You're a support, remember? Um, um, it's helpful to say something like, you're not going crazy because some uh, persons who have been abused, they deal with gaslighting. You need to look that up, gaslighting, where the oppressor tries to make them think that they're crazy or they're unreasonable. You know, so it's helpful to say something like, you're not going crazy. You know, instead of saying something like, well, if I were you, I would, no. That's why you have to listen. See that? Um, um, have you thought about, that's another thing. Have you thought about, you know, um, instead of you should. Or you did what you had to do to be safe. You know, that's a good thing to say. You did what you had to do to be safe. Because sometimes people feel guilty. You see about uh, taking a, uh, out of, what is that? The, um, some of those orders, court orders, they feel guilty. But you did what you had to do to be safe. Um, you know, that's important. And things like, I believe in you, you know, you don't have to be so spiritual all the time. You can actually be a real person and say things like, you know, I believe in you, you know, and listen, just listen. And I see you, Sister Tamara. I learned so much about gaslighting in your class. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I learned so much about gaslighting in your class at Shaw University Divinity School. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I tell you, um, Miss Tamara, I really wish that I could give as much information in this uh, talk as I could in an entire semester. 
but I know that's not possible. But I went a little longer because I saw someone said, no, 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 don't go. So I, I, I gave a little more information, but I just encourage you. There's just so much more and I certainly don't know it all. I don't know everything. Um, I thank God for the students in that class and I get to teach it again in, um, in January. And so I'm looking forward to the spring but um, but there's just so much to learn, and I just appreciate you all being here. And again, if you have dealt with violence or dealing with violence, please know you can contact, you can call that National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-7233, okay? Um, you're welcome. Um, I hope this was helpful. I thank you all for talking back to me. That's so important because we learn and grow together. None of us know it all. Um, and you know that what I try to do is create a safe space, no matter what we're talking about, even when it comes to the Bible, because Lord knows I don't ever want to be considered a spiritual abuser, <laughs> even as a uh, trauma-informed faith leader. So God bless you all. I hope you have a great night, and I just appreciate you being here. I did go a little longer for you, so thank you so much. And you just have a blessed night, and take care of you.